Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Bernathan College's The Importance of Play, a virtual lecture by Gabrielle Principe of the College of Charleston. My name is Amanda Lichtenstein, and I am the Alumni Relations Manager for Bernathan College. Thank you for joining us today. If at any time during the presentation you experience technical difficulties with the broadcast, please contact me via email at amanda.lichtenstein at bernathan.edu. To submit a question to our presenter, you may use the Q&A feature of this website or email me. Again, that's amanda.lichtenstein, L-I-C-H-T-E-N-S-T-E-I-N, at bernathan.edu. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Gabrielle Principe. Dr. Principe currently serves as the chair of the Department of Psychology of the College of Charleston. Her research centers on social cognitive development with a focus on factors affecting young children's memory for personally experienced events. Her, di her diverse research includes the impact of rumors and other sorts of natural conversations on memory, the influence of fantasy beliefs on event recollections, and the effect of retelling context on autobiographical narratives. She is the author of the book, Your Brain on Childhood, The Unexpected Side Effects of Classrooms, Ballparks, Family Rooms, and the Minivan. She earned her PhD in developmental psychology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell University. As the mother of an 11th month old child, I am very excited to hear Dr. Principe's insights. Thank you for joining us today, Gabby. Thank you, Amanda, so much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure um, to have this opportunity to talk to you all and such a pleasure to be contacted by Amanda, who was a former student of mine when um, I was at Ursinus College. So. Um, this is fun to do. So give me um, a minute. I'm going to try to see if I can flip on my slides. And uh, hang on. Hmm. Amanda, I don't see my slides like I did just a minute ago. Well, let's, I, I can um, flip them on from my end then. Okay. Okay. Okay, I think we are up and running. Okay, fantastic. Um, so what I tried to do today is just to put together a little discussion of, um, how evolutionary developmental psychologists um, think about human development, how it happens, um, and in particular spend a bit of time talking about um, play and why play is important an important context for, um, for child development. Um, so if you want to go to the slide, Amanda. Okay. So um, Depending on which lens you look at childhood, you could make the case that something, something is wrong with childhood. Certainly things have been changing. There's increased rates of things like childhood depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, phobias, particularly um, school phobias. And there's also been increases um, in the diagnoses of developmental disorders um, like autism and Asperger's syndrome. Um, also, rates of prescription stimulants, um, antidepressants, and other sorts of mood stabilizers um, have tripled just in the past 10 years. And right now, about 5% um, of kids nationwide are on stimulants for ADHD. So those numbers are, are high, and you know, as a parent, um, uh, they're disconcerting to hear. Um, there are physical changes that are going on as well. Um, probably most of you know obesity is um, an issue in uh, in lots of countries, including in the United States. Um, but what's particularly disconcerting is how much obesity has increased um, over time. In the 1960s, less than 5% of kids were obese. Today, nearly 20% of American children um, are obese. Um, certainly some of that has something to do with diet, but um, you know, I'm interested in talking about play today, and play often, particularly for young kids, involves um, physical activity, so perhaps these things are related. 
Um, something else that might be related, um, there's been an increase in vitamin D deficiency and um, insufficiency. And vitamin D, of course, is important for bone development. Um, and without typical levels of vitamin D, kids are at risk for things like fractures and later on osteoporosis. Um, and if you look at um, just measures of like general health and wellness, um, we are decreasing um, um, over time as well. There are also problems in the classroom, if you want to flip to the next slide. Um, over 38% of high school seniors are proficient in reading and only 26 in math. There's even evidence that kids um, are slipping rather than increasing, despite increased money that's going into education, despite you know, the failed no, no uh, one child left behind. And in fact, one study showed that the performance of fifth graders on scientific problem solving tasks has fallen by three years within the past two decades. Um, to make matters worse, there's evidence that our children are sliding behind other countries. On one global test, it's a piece of the Program for International Study Assessment. Um, it's a big test that um, over 30 countries take. Our country um, is ranked 25th in math and 21st in science skills. Um, there's some international assessments, in fact, that we have dropped out of. In 2007, the United States quietly withdrew from the trends in mathematics and science study. Um, in the past, our high school seniors um, performed shockingly bad. In the last survey done in 1995, students from only two countries, South Africa and Cyprus, scored lower than Americans. Um, and something else that worries me, too, as a parent and an educator, um, there's been a drop in um, a range of social cognitive skills. Self-regulation is something particularly, particularly worrisome, and I'll, I'll talk about why um, in a bit. Um, but one study that's a classic study that a lot of developmentalists talk about um, is that today's five-year-olds have the self-regulatory skills of four-year-olds in the 1940s. Um, that's important because self-regulation serves as a red flag to parents and educators and, and pediatricians. Um, because poor self-regulatory skills are associated with um, a range of problematic things like ADHD, school dropout, drug use, um, and crime. So um, if you go to the next slide, Amanda, <laughs> um, it's true that children um, are facing growing problems to their health, to their happiness, and to their success. Um, but I like to think the problem really is not with our children. They're as playful, as spirited, as funny, and as full of life as, as they've always been. Um, what's changed is, is their environment and the levels of stimulation and stress that we expect them to deal with. Um, next slide, please. So children today clearly live a radically different lifestyle than they used to. So if I think about what childhood was like, when I was young, I'm 47, um, it's different now. My kids clearly have a different childhood than, than I did. Um, and I don't know how many of you have similar experiences, but as a kid, you know, we were all on our own when school was let out. Um, we just went out the back door, we stayed out until it was dark, came home for dinner, and were pushed back, uh, pushed back outside. Um, I don't remember doing that much homework. Um, I'm sure I did some, um, but if I look at my two kids today, um, they're 16 and 12, both have hours of homework every night. Um, I think I had the freedom, um, and so did other kids in my generation, to do a lot of playing because we didn't have a lot um, of other sorts of things going on. Uh, we weren't signed up for ballet classes, lacrosse league, painting studio, clarinet lessons, drama club, and Girl Scouts, and math tutor all in the same week. Our schedules weren't that full. Um, our parents didn't drive us to pick up games. We just kind of hung out and kicked a ball around. Um, if we wanted to play with someone, our mom didn't arrange a play date. Um, we just walked to our friend's house and rapped on the door and asked if our friend could come out to play. Um, we got dirty, we got skinned knees, we got tangled hair, and we got sand in our eyes. We used our outside voice, we explored the neighborhood on our bicycles, and not a single grown up ever butted in to our fun, to our play. We invented our own games. We made our own rules, um, and we formed our own teams. And really, in retrospect, childhood was a lot of fun. Next slide, please. But I think within the space of just a couple of decades, um, just about everything about childhood has changed. 
Um, today, infants find themselves strapped into bouncy seats and put in front of the TV set. Toddlers are put in their play yards, they listen to classical music, and they're handed learning laptops. Preschoolers have dollhouses that talk, they have robotic, robotic pet dogs, and they have battery-powered frogs that teach them their ABCs. Um, and older children, including mine, sit in front of computer screens with earbuds connected to their iPods, texting their friends on their touch phone to see if they can come over and play video games. So imaginary worlds have already be, been created for them um, by adults and loaded onto their gaming consoles. Um, more kids today are inside rather than outside, um, more constantly supervised, and when they make it outside, Sometimes it's only to a manufactured playground that's been designed and built by adults or to an organized space, a sports game that's on a manic manicured field that's often scheduled, officiated, and coached by adults. Um, a lot of kids spend their weekdays in a classroom, seated at rows of desks, reciting timetables, drilling word banks, and memorizing state capitals, and their weekends are filled with activities that are organized supervised and timed by adults. Next slide, please. Um, however, like clearly childhood has changed since I was a kid to what childhood um, is today. But as an evolutionary developmental psychologist, it's important um, to put childhood in the correct history, in deep history, and to think of the sorts of childhoods that have been typical for our species. Um, for over 99% of human history, um, we lived in small nomadic bands and we've made our, our living um, hunting and gathering. Children spent their days roaming in packs and playing on their own in the out of doors. Um, they improvised their own fun, regulated their own games, and made up their own rules. They were schooled informally in a hands-on manner at the uh, in a hands-on manner by older peers and by uh, older family members and adults. They learned new skills on the job as they collaborated with familiar others on tasks that are meaningful to everyday life. Next slide, please. Why should we care what childhood um, has been in the past? Why should we care about the childhood of the typical hunter-gatherer and why it differs from childhood today? Well, the answer um, is up on this slide. It says childhood has changed, but children's brains have not. Modern children come into the world with the very same brain and accompanying tendencies, abilities, and adaptations as their nomadic hunter-gatherer ancestors dating back 35,000 years, but perhaps as far back as 250,000 years. Um, what's more is that many parts of children's bra brains originated um, even deeper in our evolutionary past, even before there was language, conscious thought, um, before there were thumbs, before there were humans, before creatures like us even existed. Many parts of the brains that are in our heads and our children's heads originated long, long ago um, in other animals. So, what does this recognition of the deep history of our brains mean for children today? Next slide, please. Um, it means that the brains inside children's heads were not designed with modern life in mind. They did not evolve to learn in the classroom, play with manufactured toys, or interact with high technology. Rather, they evolved for life in a very different world. At different times in the brain's evolutionary history, it developed in the deep seas, freshwater streams, tropical rainforest, and the grasslands of the savannas, not in classrooms, not in living rooms, not in manufactured playgrounds, not in manufactured ball fields, and certainly not in the minivan. These sorts of evolutionarily novel environments have changed the way that children behave and develop. But today's children still enter their respective worlds with a brain that never expected to find itself in any of them. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to argue today is it's this disconnect between children's evolutionary past, their deep history, and their human present that makes part of the modern world challenging and sometimes even damaging to the development of their brains, their bodies, and consequently um, their behaviors. Next slide, please. 
So what's happened? Um, how is it the case that I'm trying to make an argument that we have all these things, these toys, these activities, these curricula, that don't really match what's good um, for typical child development, for typical brain development? Um, to some extent, it's because our generation of parents, educators, and policymakers have been swept up in a flurry of assumptions about how to best rear and educate our children. Many of us um, have a view of child development as a race, that the faster you finish childhood, the better off that you'll be, that the sooner that children have the basics under the belt, the quicker that they'll advance to more complicated material, and frankly, the more successful they'll be in life. These assumptions about children, really, and how they learn have propelled my generation of parents and educators into the grips, clearly, of, of marketers. Marketers who have sensed these pressures on parents and educators and who have been happy to design products and curricula to help products they say that boost brain development and that are going to give children a head start. And we're suckers for the message that they're selling because we want to do everything we can for their children. We want to set them up with every opportunity to get them ahead and to give them a leg up. We certainly have good intentions. That goes without saying. Um, life is very competitive and we want to do what's the best for our children. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind, and next slide please, the important thing to keep in mind is that the goal of marketers is to get our attention and to make us buy more of what they're selling. Their goal is not to accurately inform us about how child development happens. Um, next slide please. Um, so it seems to me that um, a lot of parents and some educators are um, kind of better versed in the version of brain development that marketers use to sell toys, education programs, parenting magazines, video games, any of the stuff that you see on the slide. Um, but the problem with this is that the marketer's version is made up of claims that go wildly beyond the conclusions drawn by the scientist who actually did the research. There are countless products on the shelf, like the ones that you see there, that say on their marketing materials that these things are scientifically proven to build better brains. Um, but that's not true. It's this sort of marketing is absolutely appalling to those of us in the scientific community because we are well aware that none of these products, nothing, there's no evidence that any baby toy or baby program has ever been de demonstrated to make superior brains. Nor, nor would we think, think that it would. Um, so as a result, many parents and educators have been duped into thinking that these sorts of things um, are good for child development. And the marketing is very persuasive. Um, that well-intentioned parents and educators buy into these sorts of things um, because of the hope that the packaging of these things um, tells parents. But in fact, again, none of these goods um, does any good. Um, and in fact, some of these um, things can be harmful um, to developing brains. So how have marketers and the media been able to get away with this? Um, next slide, please. It's sort of our fault. It's the fault of the developmental scientists like myself. We rarely talk to parents. We rarely talk to educators. Um, here at the College of Charleston, um, I'm in the Department of Psychology. There's a handful of developmentalists there. We rarely go over to the School of Education and talk with those folks about our research um, and vice versa. That sort of interaction um, doesn't happen, nor is it often the case that um, scientists have conversations um, with parents, so as a result, most folks who are not researchers, who are not in the lab, um, might not be versed in the science of how brains really develop, of what children really need to develop, um, to develop well. And my argument is that this causes very well-meaning people, well-meaning parents, educators, and, and policymakers. Um, to do odd sorts of things. So if you look at my next slide, um, how do we fix the problem? Um, am I about to argue that we should go back to our hunter-gatherer ways? Because 
that's the sort of environment the children have been in for over 90%, 99% um, of our species' existence. No, that would be absolutely silly, you know, plus I like things like my iPad and coffee and all that, and I don't want to give that up. So certainly I don't think that this is the way to go. Um, but if you look at the next slide, um, this is really the answer that most developmentalists give, um, that the way to deal with this mismatch between what children's brains expect and what we give them um, is to be more deliberate in designing children's lives and to design their lives, their homes, their schools, their toys, what they play with and what they do, their pastimes, in ways that gel with how evolution has built the brain um, to grow. All right. Next slide, please. Good. All right. So this is the solution. At least I think it's one solution, and I think it's at least uh, worth kind of thinking about and letting it marinate and thinking about the extent to which looking at human development and in particular childhood, so things that happen on the early end of our lifespan um, happen and if we look at them through um, an evolutionary developmental lens I think they look a little bit differently. So if you take a look at the next slide, um, the way that I viewed childhood before I became a developmentalist was um, you know, kind of the early messy part of the lifespan. Um, and I think that's kind of typical. I also think it's typical for folks to think about human development as a pro progression, um, that it starts with these beings, these infants, these preschoolers um, who are messy, who are um, unfinished, incomplete versions of a human, um, and that the target of development, the end point of development, where all the action happens, is adulthood. So we see children as starting out as immature and inefficient beings who develop into mature and efficient ones. We see infants and, and children as, as unfinished, incomplete version of adults. However, when you look at ch childhood um, from this viewpoint, it seems that the immaturity of childhood, all of the mess, mess of it all, the mayhem of it all, um, seems merely like a necessity that our species has to endure on our way to, to adulthood, the period of life that counts. And if you've ever spent an afternoon um, with a preschooler, like certainly it seems it can seem like adults, like children are very inefficient um, and inept adults. They can't do anything. They can't tie their own shoes. They can't make a sandwich. They can't balance their checkbook. They're really easily distracted, they're exceedingly irrational, and they're shamelessly sloppy. So these everyday experiences um, can make childhood feel like it must be something endured um, in order to get to childhood. I mean, in order to get to adulthood, pardon me. Um, I think as a result of these sorts of conclusions about childhood, uh, many professionals and lay people feel that the sooner the children get to levels of adult functioning, the better. And I think it's this belief that drives the push among parents to send their children to academic preschools or after-school supplemental education programs, that drives schools to cut recess and playful learning, and frankly, that drives the successes of marketers who sell toys, games, and curricula and other products designed to boost brain growth. However, if you look at development um, in the way that's uh, illustrated on the screen, um, there's another way to think about development that isn't a linear progression from the immature to the mature. Consider the metamorphosis of caterpillars to butterflies. Um, I have a picture of each up there and take a look at that caterpillar. It's really not the case that that caterpillar is an immature form of the butterfly. Rather, the caterpillar is an animal with a set of distinct traits and behaviors that are adapted to its present life as a caterpillar and not to its future life as a butterfly. And in fact, if you look at those two animals and you didn't know what they were, um, I really think that you, A, couldn't tell that they're the same animal, but B, that you can see that the characteristics of that caterpillar um, are every bit just as refined and complex as those of the butterfly. Um, these ideas um, come from um, a developmental psychologist named Dave Bjorklund at Florida Atlantic University. 
He argues that human development is better characterized in this manner as a metamorphosis, like caterpillars becoming butterflies, than as a linear growth from the immature to the mature. So just like that caterpillar has its own complex organization adapted to the environment in which it lives presently, so does the child. So in an evolutionary developmental framework, children are not um, amateur versions of adults focused on becoming adults, on gaining adult perfection and complexity. Instead, children are a distinct form of our human species that are uniquely adapted to the physical, social, and cognitive demands of the environment in which they find themselves. When you look at childhood, I think, through this evolutionary developmental lens, it becomes clear that not all the characteristics of infants and children are preparations for adulthood, and in fact, some function to adapt kids to the environment that they're in, and when those characteristics are no longer needed, they go away. So from this perspective, all of the mayhem and mess of childhood really isn't a necessary evil, um, but rather they play an adaptive role in children's lives. So what are some examples um, of what I'm talking about? Well, we can really easily look to research and developmental science um, to find examples of what seem like immaturities, what seem like immature adaptations, um, but they're, they're not. They're there for a purpose, for a particular developmental period, and when they no longer serve that function, they disappear. Um, the most obvious of these are physical and happen early in life. Um, the placenta is an example of these. Right? The placenta provides um, food and oxygen to the developing organism during the prenatal period. And what happens at birth in a new developmental period, there's an extreme transformation that occurs in newborns eat and breathe in an entirely different manner. Um, other examples are things like um, infant reflexes. So there's a sucking and a rooting reflex. Um, these sorts of things promote survival, right? Early in life, it's a good thing that infants have that sucking reflex, but it's also a good thing that we lose that reflex later on, too, because that would be really embarrassing if they persisted into adulthood. Um, we also have um, motor and sensory limitations. For example, um, infants have really poor visual acuity, but it turns out that that poor visual acuity um, is very adaptive because it works to reduce the amount of visual information that infants have to deal with and it consequently means that other developing sensory systems like hearing don't have to compete for real estate in the development, developing brain. Um, and we know this from animal research. Um, so for example, um, if you shine a light, crack a little hole in a uh, an egg of a baby chick and you shine a light in there so you're giving that animal an experience that's earlier than expected and um, what happens is that animal after it hatches will have better than typical eyesight however um, the downside to that too early experience um, is that it messes with their auditory development um, and that animal won't follow the maternal call of its species which is something that's important um, of course, for baby chicks to have to survive. And there's also examples in childhood. I'll give you a couple. Um, one of my favorites is that, um, and if you've spent any time with preschoolers, you certainly know this, um, is that young children tend to think that they're better than they are, that they're more skilled than they really are. Um, and that's cute, but it turns out it's also adaptive. Um, we know that children who estimate their own abilities, who think they're better than they are, those are the kids who are more willing to take on challenging tasks and to persist longer than are more realistic children. Um, so this overestimation of abilities is good because it increased persistence, which in turn boosts learning. Um, and you know, my favorite example is if you've ever seen a, a preschooler on the dance floor um, at a wedding, you certainly know that they're overestimating their dancing abilities. And it's fine. It certainly doesn't hurt anyone. But it's also a good thing that that adaptation goes away, because it would be uncomfortable if you're 30 and you still overestimate your dancing skill um, like you did when you were three. So the whole reason that I'm going here is because play is one of these things, too. Same goes for play. Play is not an immature behavior at all whatsoever. It's what kids do. 
And because of the environmental context um, that they're in, they can get away with things that we can't. So if you put on the next slide for me, um, here's just some pictures of kids playing, and I think um, this might help uh, drive home what I'm talking about. But if you're two, you can get away with engaging in all of these activities, right? If you're your age, you can't. If you're two, you can get away with acting, uh, you know, like a, a two-headed monster um, is in your closet. You can get away with um, telling people that the chair that's empty next to you at the dinner table um, is occupied by a friend of yours, right? So you can get away with that stuff when you're a preschooler. You can't do it when you're your age. Um, the point that I want to make is that children engage in play not because they're immature, but because play is the primary means through which children learn how to make sense of the world and how to act in it, how to interact with others, how to think, how to problem solve, how to be creative, how to cooperate, how to self-regulate themselves as well as their emotions. This context is special and it's important that children have the opportunity to engage in, in, um, in this context. We want children to do this. We don't want to squash any of this and think that we know better ways to get them to adulthood um, quickly. Um, what's interesting to me, yeah, that's good. <laughs> what's, in, what's interesting to me um, is that play has gotten a bad rap, and I'll tell you why there's rats playing with the ball on the screen in a second. Um, but I think that a lot of people think that play um, is a waste of time and that it's good for nothing. And if you look at kids playing, it sort of looks that way. It looks like, hey, you know, stop playing in that puddle and go fill out that math worksheet. It's more important that you know your times tables than how to splash around in a puddle. Um, but that's not really the case because play is something that's essential if you're a child. Play only looks like a waste of time if you don't know what it does. So let me give you um, a clear example, I think, of what playing can do. Um, so picture um, a couple of preschoolers that are kind of hanging out in the family room together. Um, they're just being lightly supervised. Um, they're likely to invent something. They're likely to invent a game. Um, they're likely to say, okay, hey, let's play house. I'm going to be the mommy. You be the baby. Here, eat your cereal. After that, it's time for a nap. Lay down right here. Pull up your blanket. Now I'm going to read you a story. Stop barking. You're not the pet dog. That's such a complex behavior, and it's common for three-year-olds and older to engage in those sorts of behaviors. When kids are doing those sorts of things, they're creating their own rules. They're negotiating their own roles in the play. Who's the baby? Who's the mommy? Um, and they're agreeing, essentially, to subordinate any internal impulses to do something else that don't conform to that storyline that they've co-created. That's a really extremely sophisticated set of behaviors, and we're the only animal that can pull those off. Not even a chimp can do that. Um, it's a powerful context for developing social skills, um, for social uh, emotional regulation skills, and I'll talk about that later, but I don't think that that hits you in the face when you see two kids playing house. Um, it might look like they'd be better off using that time, I don't know, doing worksheets or studying flashcards if you don't know what play does. Play clearly looks silly. Um, however, we know that play um, is important, and work coming out of neuroscience labs is increasingly telling us this. Um, it's telling us that play is a central means through which all animals, um, all higher order animals, need to develop typically. And the reason I have this slide up here is to remind me to tell you that we know that if rat pups like these guys um, are prevented from playing, that they have a much more immature pattern um, of neuronal connections in their brain's medial prefrontal cortex compared to pups with typical play experiences. So like humans, Rats and other mammals are born with um, an overabundance of cortical brain cells and connections that are pruned and selectively eliminated as a result of feedback from experiences during um, the juvenile period. And play is thought to be one of those juvenile experiences that helps in this pruning. 
Um, and these findings and you know abundant other findings um, provide direct evidence that depriving animals, even rats, um, of play has direct implications for brain development. All right, next slide, please. So why is play so important? Um, developmentalists talk about um, the kaleidoscopic uh, quality um, of play. So the notion that play comes in um, all sorts of flavors, right? So there's tag, which is not the same as wall ball, which is not the same as dressing up, which is not the same as playing cops and robbers, which is not the same as playing foursquare, which is not the same as battling with army men, right? So the almost unending flavors of play makes people like me, makes developmentalists think that plays many flavors um, are an adaptive way for juveniles to develop a diverse array of behaviors. Think about it this way. If the only sort of play that the human child did was, say, hide and go seek, um, then the behaviors of, you know, that play would foster would be limited. But since play comes in so many flavors, it teaches a wide array of skills and essentially trains children for just about anything that life might throw their way. And those who study play refer this to this idea as a flexibility hypothesis and describe it as a notion that a big menu of play supports the growth of more supple um, and flexible brains. Importantly, um, behavioral flexibility and variability um, is a good thing. It's adaptive, right? It's important to be able to change your behavior in response to a changing environment. It's beneficial to have a broad set of behaviors in your arsenal, given you never quite know what life will throw at you. And this flexibility is a hallmark of humans. We are more flexible than any other species, and it's what helps us thrive and survive anywhere um, in the globe. So play is good training for what the brain can't expect. Um, the flavorfulness of play also describes why researchers have found um, that it has so many benefits to humans um, during our early development. So for example, let me talk about attention and self-regulatory skills again. Um, there's an absolutely enormous literature shows that play builds these skills um, and that children who indulge themselves regularly in play um, also tend to have advanced language abilities. Um, they display more creative thinking. They exhibit um, better memory capabilities, and they also show better problem-solving skills. Um, and interestingly, kids who play more um, also tend to be less stressed, which is good, right? And they also have uh, tend to have stronger um, social skills. And you know, of course, I want to point out that you know, chicken and egg questions have stirred in these data for years, you know, which is which. Um, but it seems clearly that play causes these advantages rather than the other way around, rather than kids who are um, advanced in these sorts of things play more. Um, next slide, please. Um, however, if we look at these contexts for play today again, um, and you stand back and look at human history in our, our, its deep entirety. So in deep history, um, the more dramatic change is the move away, I think, from play is something that's been largely independent, improvised, and imaginative um, for most of our history as a species, to something that, if you look at these sorts of toys, that is more scripted um, and more supervised by adults and I worry about this general loss of autonomous um, and creative play. It's worrisome because when children um, use their imagination, so by improvising with props, creating their own games, and developing new storylines, they stimulate the growth of brain cells um, in the executive portion of the frontal cortex, which is an area that lays the foundation for the circuitry of what's known as executive function. Um, right, so executive function refers to a whole um, suite of skills that's important um, for other cognitive abilities like attention and memory and inhibition. It's also involved in self-regulation, which um, is a critical skill for controlling emotions, um, resisting or inhibiting impulses, exerting self-control um, and self-discipline as well. Um, this is important because kids who are highly self-regulated do well with their peers. They can wait their turn on the playground. 
Um, they can resist the temptation to grab a desired toy from a playmate. They know to clean up after a play date without much nagging. And they automatically help a peer who's, say, struggling um, to build something with her Legos. Um, and kids who are highly self-regulated also persist at um, challenging tasks longer than those who um, have lower self-regulation. Um, Well-regulated kids can also actively try to control negative emotion. Um, and they do this by bringing online skills like um, they'll talk to themselves um, loudly or they'll um, change their goals. So for example, if they see someone else using um, a toy that they want to use, they switch their goals and will direct their attention towards another toy. So why does free play develop these sorts of self-regulatory skills? It's because it puts the action in children's hands. So if, say, a child wants to make up a pretend storyline um, where she's the teacher and her playmates are the students, her friends have to follow her rules if they want to play along. Or they may push and pull and argue with one another to agree on a set of rules and negotiate how they'll be reinforced. Um, either way, this is the development of self-control in action. Um, children's private speech also builds self-regulatory skills. So, as I mentioned, during play, kids often talk out loud to themselves um, to kind of lay out the ground rules for themselves or, or even to direct their next set of actions. Um, and if you listen in on kids playing um, and while they're talking to themselves, um, you hear them working through what they're going to do now and how they're going to do things um, next. And if you listen often enough, you'll learn that this sort of self-regulating language is highest when kids are pretending, when they're engaged in pretend play. Um, I also bring up self-regulation because it's not um, only a key ingredient to be a successful kid, um, but what's really interesting about it is it's a really powerful variable that predicts effective development really in a whole range of dom domains. And in fact, self-regulation is a better predictor of school success, of academic performance, than is IQ, so then a measure of intelligence. Um, there's also an interesting relationship between um, recent declines in free play and changes in self-regulatory skills. So if I put up a graph charting recent changes in children's free play time next to a graph charting changes in children's self-regulatory skills, you would see that both have been plummeting along the same curve. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, today's five-year-olds seem to have the same self-regulatory skills of three-year-olds in the 1940s. That's not good. Um, because we know that unstructured play builds self-regulation and that both have decreased in recent decades, um, you can't help but wonder whether the drop in free play has caused the drop in self-regulation. Certainly, to be sure, more research is needed because we certainly don't have that answer. Um, but this pattern in the literature should really serve as a red flag, I think, to parents and educators because poor self-regulatory skills, um, as I mentioned, are associated with a range of um, problem behaviors, including things like crime, drug use, school dropout. Um, however, you know, I would argue that the more that we do things like the play you see on that slide, the more we structure children's play, the more we make up rules, the more we script their toys, the more we generally butt into children's play, the less likely um, they are to engage in private speech um, that boosts self-regulation. The more children's play is focused on, um, I don't know, soccer games or video games or battery-powered toys, the fewer opportunities they have to practice self-regulation and to police, um, to police themselves. Um, the last thing I want to talk really briefly, if you go ahead, um, I think one slide, mm, maybe one more, yeah, um, let me talk a little bit um, just briefly about um, organized sports, maybe organized plays, so things that we do as adults to kind of um, get kids to play in a way that maybe we want them to or that we think is good for them, right? Um, so certainly a good deal of children's play, especially the physical sorts of things that kids do, um, is organized and supervised and timed by 
by us adults. Um, a lot of kids um, participate um, in organized sports, and we organize it, right? We form the teams, we schedule the games, we make the rules, we coach from the sidelines, and we call the fouls. Surely this is good fun, and there's much to be gained. I'm not disrespecting organized sports at all. These sorts of um, experiences um, boost children's rule govern behavior, um, and they also have a positive effect on children's interactions, um, cooperative interactions with peers. It, it's a way that teaches kids how to act as a group towards a common goal. However, if you remove the coach, if you remove the parent, you get a very different flavor of, of play um, when you leave children to their own devices. Children's free play doesn't have built-in rules like organized sports. Or if it does, the rules are developed negotiated and enforced by kids themselves. So free play affords more creative behavior. Um, it also challenges children's brains more than does merely following um, like the predetermined rules of a soccer game. When children are out playing on their own, um, they can try out their own imagination, experiment with making and breaking the rules that they collaboratively make, and they can test out new rules. Um, why are these sorts of experiences important? Why are games of, I don't know, Foursquare, Backyard Mock Battles, Sardines, Pickup Games, um, why are they important? Well, they also help children develop strong social skills um, that are important, both when you're a kid and, and certainly throughout life. We know that children who are interpersonally skilled, who have a high um, social intelligence, do well in just about everything. They even tend to do better in the cognitive um, academic realm. And that's true both when they're kids and it's true later on as adults. So those who are socially awkward children not only risk being unpopular in childhood, um, but a lack of social skills in childhood also increases um, children's proneness um, to later sorts of negative consequences like academic failure, um, crime, drug use, and emotional disorders. What's really important is that children can't learn all of the social skills that they need from parents, from adults, from educators. Um, they need to interact freely with peers to develop um, a sophisticated suite of interpersonal um, social skills. So what do other kids have that we adults don't have? Um, everything. Unstructured play with peers is a demanding and motivating context both socially and cognitively, like no other. The double whammy of high demands and high motivation is free play's secret sauce. No other context has that. Consider the high level of um, social cognitive demand that's associated with engaging in sustained peer interaction. Children have to figure out on their own what's acceptable social behavior and what's not. If in the context of play they lose control of their emotions, if they refuse to take turns, or if they break the rules, they lose their playmates. They're out of the game. They're out of the fun. But because children enjoy playing so, so much, it means that they're motivated to do the prerequisite social cognitive work to accomplish high-level tasks. They learn how to cooperate. They learn how to pay close and sustained attention. They learn how to filter out distractions. They learn how to follow negotiated rules, and they learn how to regulate their emotion. When there's no adult authority to mediate disagreements, ch children are forced to learn how to do it themselves and how to negotiate among themselves as equals. To keep the play going, they'll also learn to consider others' feelings and others' desires, to see um, situations from others' points of view. As they do, they develop important social skills like persistence, and like the ability to negotiate. Also, keeping play friendly with peers demands um, effective and frankly high-level communication skills, which arguably is one of the most valuable skills that we have to learn in childhood. Um, importantly, these are all social cognitive skills that not only help with peers there on the playground, but they help in the classroom and they help later on um, in life. And we know these things from observational studies, um, and we also know them from what happens to children when 
Um, there's a lack of free play, and again, we know this from looking at animal research when animals are prevented um, from playing. They develop social problems as well. What's a social problem for a rat? Well, if you're a, a play-deprived rat, um, you fail to recognize um, important like rat social nuances that you need <laughs> to learn and to be attentive to um, in order, for example, to, to find a mate, so in order to, to reproduce. Um, and one takeaway lesson um, that I hope that you guys can get from, um, from that little bit is that you can't directly teach social skills. You can't do it as an adult. And in fact, there's research that demonstrates that when we try to teach social skills, um, we end up doing more harm than good. So for example, there's research that if you reward children for cooperating, or if you reward children for helping behavior, that it actually decreases further cooperation or helping behavior. Um, and for psychologists, that's a no-brainer. Anytime you reward a behavior um, that is motivated internally, what happens? Um, is the focus of that behavior then is towards the reward rather than the behavior. So if you start getting rewarded for cooperating, you begin to focus on cooperating for that reward rather than the natural benefits that come out of um, cooperating um, in and of itself. Okay. Um, I think I'm probably just about out of time, right? So I think I'm, I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions. Great. So thank you, Gabby, for that presentation. Sure. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank Angela Rose, who is the chair of Renathan College's Department of Education, um, for suggesting this program and speaker, um, as well as India Simmons, who is the professor of the college's course on play, movement, and health. And her class has been viewing the event today, as well as Renathan College alumni around the world. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first is from Angela Rose, mm -hmm. and she says, Preschool teachers report feeling a lot of pressure to do academic work with even very young children. The pressure often comes from perceptions of parental expectations, but also from the dominant trend in education today. What advice do you have for preschool teachers, many of whom are, our alumni are, um, who feel pressured into doing academic work with three and four year old children? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I certainly think that there is a lot of um, pressure, certainly for preschool teachers, and even, um, I think, too, for teachers in older grades um, as well. But um, for preschool teachers, I mean, honestly, the advice that I would give is for them to give science-based advice. Um, there is certainly, um, as I mentioned, you know, a range of um, research studies that demonstrate really convincingly that play-based learning has all sorts of benefits um, that doesn't come and can't come from rote learning, rote memorization, that can't come from worksheets, that can't focus on academics. Um, and there's been an increasing number of scientists who um, have been doing um, kind of what I'm trying to do, is get the science you know, out, out of the laboratory, out of our stuffy journals, and share it with people who can use it, share it with parents and educators. So, um, you know, I'm happy to share um, websites or blogs or easily digestible, um, accessible information that can make the case to parents that play is an important context for learning. Certainly so are academic exercises. Uh, play, you know, there's overwhelming evidence that play is important. So maybe going the science route would be helpful. Okay, great. And we have another question that came in before the presentation. Um, sure. It says, can you state the things children learn through various types of play? Have a list of corresponding actions with cognitive possibilities. Uh, oh, having a list of corresponding actions with cognitive possibilities would be helpful when talking with parents who have a hard time conceiving that learning can happen without workbooks. So I think you spoke to some of this um, during your presentation, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? You know, um, sure. So one of the things that I um, that I didn't talk about, and there's been increasing research on this, which I think is really cool, um, it's coming out of um, a couple of laboratories um, at uh, Temple University in, in Philly and um, the University of Delaware as well. There's two researchers, Ka Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Galinkoff, um, who are doing this really cool series of studies where they're looking at 
Um, learning of intellectual skills, so learning of math skills, learning of language, really specific skills that kids have to learn, or you know, that kids are targeted to learn at certain ages. Um, and they're looking at, um, they're comparing generally three different contexts. So they're comparing traditional kind of rote memorization or uh, like structured teaching, like lecturing or talking, versus free play versus a third thing that I didn't talk about at all that's called guided play, um, which is really kind of setting up situations for children where you give them the tools that they need to learn a new concept and you kind of push them along, you scaffold them along, you act as a coach and you help them discover relationships, you help them discover new words, new grammar, um, but you don't teach it to them, they discover it themselves and certainly that's not at all a new concept. Um, in, in the education literature. Um, but I encourage you guys um, to, to check out Kathy Hirsch Pasics and Roberta Galenkoff's um, work. You can go to either of their websites um, and they have articles that you can download. But I think that that stuff um, is, is really cool and, and relevant to those and very relevant to those in early childhood education. Okay, great. So we're just at the five o'clock mark, so that'll uh, conclude our presentation. I want to thank you again, uh, Gabby, for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Uh, Thanks so much for the invite. Oh, thank you. And thank you to all the alumni and the students that were able to uh, join us. Um, and this, this event will also be archived on the college's YouTube page, so you can uh, rewatch it uh, at any point in the future if you choose. So thank you again, everyone. Have a, a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.